is consumerist consumption, dangerous dysfunction, disguised as expensive taste. I'm a people disgraced by what I claim I need and what I want to waste. I take no account for nothing if it's not mine. Misappropriation of funds, protect my 90% with my guns. Whose side am I on? Well, who's Slaves, orphans, widows, and homeless graves. I sold their souls just to build my private mansion. Some people say that my time is coming. Kingdom come is the justice running down, down, down on me. I'm a poor child. I'm a lost son. So that you can find it. First to be last when the true will come. Live it like a humble fool to overcome. It's upside down with its dawn of a dying world. Zion, I build with hands, and in this place, gotta dwell with man. Sick be healed, and the crippled stand singing hallelujah. My kingdom built with the blood of my son. Selfless sacrifice for everyone. Faith, hope, Love and harmony. I said, let this world know me by your love, by your love. Oh, my child. Please find a seat. Um, thank you all for coming out um, this morning. Our first Monday speaker series is delighted to welcome Catherine Leary Alsdorf as she addresses us on how we connect our work with God's. Mrs. Alsdorf provides consulting support uh, and develops resources to help churches equip their people for cultural leadership at Redeemer City to City, a Manhattan-based church planting center. She founded Redeemer Center for Faith and Work in 2002 to equip and mobilize the congregation for its mission to serve and renew the city. There, she served as executive director until December 2012, setting the vision and strategy for the center's core programs, developing staff and leadership, and guiding strategic partnerships. At the Center for Faith and Work, Catherine launched programs including Gotham Fellowships, vocation groups, arts ministries, and entrepreneurship initiative. She also co-authored a book with Tim Keller, Every Good Endeavor, and continues to serve with him as part of Redeemer City to City. Prior to her work at Redeemer, Mrs. Alzarf worked 25 years in high-tech industry, serving as president and CEO of three different companies from 1990 to 2000, including a satellite television startup, a hardware software distance learning company, and leading provider of online management education. She earned her MBA at the Darden School at the University of Virginia. Please join me in welcoming Mrs. Catherine Leary Ellsdorf.
Good morning. Thank you for coming out in the cold, frigid weather. Thank you for welcoming me to Iowa in this cold, frigid weather. It's a privilege to be here, and I'm looking forward to the whole day and a chance to get acquainted with the Dort College community. Let me just say a word of prayer, and I'll get started. Lord, thank you for the work that you're doing here. I pray that you will be the compass for all the work these students are doing now as students and all the work that you have for them when they graduate. Please guide our conversations today, and we pray for your spirit to be in this room so that we can learn what you would have us learn. In your son's name, amen. So last week, I was traveling with one of the men from our fellows program in New York City. We started this nine months fellows program called the Gotham Fellows for working professionals. It really is to help them get the kind of theological foundations that you all are getting in your four years undergrad here at Dort. This young man shared a story that I wanna share with you to kick off my comments this morning. I'm gonna call him John. He's a real estate broker in Manhattan. He sells residential co-ops and um, condo apartments. And yes, it is true, a one or maybe slightly two bedroom apartment in Manhattan can cost about $850,000. He's been working on one particular purchase for one client since July, and the deal still hadn't closed. That meant that all the work that he had done in July and August had not yet translated into a paycheck because, of course, the commission isn't paid until the sale is closed. But the closing date had been set for the prior week at long last. When they got to the closing, however, the seller had forgotten a vital document, the rights to the roof deck, which was the primary feature that John's client wanted in this particular apartment so they weren't going to close without it. To the extreme frustration of everyone in the room, they left that day without a signed deal. When John got back to his office, there was an email from the boss of the seller's broker to John. It was rude, insistent, angry that they hadn't closed, as though it was John's fault, and it was demanding that John do something about it right away. As you can imagine, John was furious. It wasn't his fault. He'd done everything he was supposed to do. His client had his papers all in line. It was the seller's agent's fault. He'd spent six months pent up frustration as he pounded out an email in response. Fortunately, he paused before he hit send. Perhaps he shouldn't use such choice language. He went back and he cleaned it up a bit and couldn't quite hit send the second time either. The nerve of this other broker's boss, but he sat back and he tried to figure out how should he react, especially if he wanted to close sometime in the near future. He didn't want to escalate the problem. He wanted to close the deal. So he typed away on a third, much more conciliatory email, suggesting still that the, other guy, the guy on the other end fixed the problem, but it was a much nicer email. But he paused again. What was happening inside him to trigger this kind of flare-up? He was starting to reflect on what was going on in his heart as a Christian who wanted to reflect the gospel in his life. Why did he lose it? Was the commission more important to him than anything else? Was he that insecure that a slur against his competence and an attempted blame shift turned him into an ugly broker when all along he'd been wanting to do his work Christianly? He dug deeper and prayed and dug deeper and came to the conclusion that he'd been acting like an orphan, like someone who didn't have a heavenly father he could trust and who loved him. He became really convicted when he thought about how mad he got when the blame was wrongly shifted to him, when he thought about how Jesus took the blame for all of us and all of our sin. Not only was he not grateful, but he, he, John, actually had wanted to punish the other broker. 
So the fourth email, the one that he did send, went something like this. I know that we both, and both our clients, are very eager to close on this property. I will see what I can do to resolve the situation, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. I use that simple example because it's one we can all relate to. How does our faith change our work? Much of the work of the gospel has to be done deep in our hearts, often in a way unbeknownst to anyone but God. What was going on here? It wasn't just that John was blamed, but often, it wasn't just, it wasn't justice that John was blamed. But often, in our walk as Jesus' disciples, we need to absorb the blame, or the hurt, or the wrong, in order to love someone else. We have to give up being right for a higher purpose. I got a message this, just this last Saturday that John was able to work with a seller and his broker to get the roof rights and the paperwork was in order and they closed on Friday. But I think just as important, John grew in his knowledge and trust that God was his loving and present father even in the midst of business. He grew in his understanding of what it means to bear the cross of false accusations and unnecessary frustration in a way that exhibits respect and love to his business colleagues. So with that introduction, let me launch into five ways that our faith, our knowledge of and belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ gives us a new compass for our work. So I'm gonna have five things. One, Christian faith gives you a solid grounding so that your work doesn't destroy you. Number two, the Christian faith gives you the idea of the dignity of all work so that your work won't bore you. It gives you a moral compass so that your work won't corrupt you. It gives you a new worldview so that work doesn't use you. And it gives you hope in the frustration of work so that your work doesn't crush you. So let me go through and sort of pull out each of those a little bit. The solid grounding. Work can destroy you. Failure can destroy you, and success can destroy you. Have any of you seen the TED Talk by Elizabeth Gilbert on creativity? She's the woman who wrote the book Eat, Play, Love, Eat, Pray, Love, which is this amazing bestseller. Um, it moved her from a writer who scraped by a living as a waitress to a superstar. And in her 2009 TED Talk, she talked about the burden of what's next. Here she was, the success, but everywhere she went, people were asking her, how was she going to top that one? Or wasn't she worried that never again would she have that kind of success, that kind of a creativity, that kind of spark of brilliance. Success can destroy you in many ways. For some, it's the fear of losing it. For some, it just goes to their head and they get all puffed up and full of themselves. Similarly, failure can destroy you. We all know, all know stories like that, where it goes right to your heart and it tells you that you're inferior, worthless, and unlovable. But the Christian faith, the, the faith that we're not orphans, but loved by God the Father, helps ground us against those hills and valleys of ordinary work life in, the, in this broken world. I love the aphorism of Jack Miller. We're worse sinners than we ever dare imagine, and we're more loved than we ever dare hope. I have that on my mirror, in my office, in my wallet. I need to know the reality of my sin and the truth of God's love. It's a ballast in a turbulent world. It smooths out the highs and lows. There's nothing we can do to separate ourselves from the love of Christ, and that grounds us. The second way our faith gives us a new compass for work is this idea of the dignity of all kinds of work. Now, the Greeks certainly didn't believe in that. Men doing menial labor were equated with the beasts of the field. Dignity was reserved for the thinkers. 
As a matter of fact, we probably have some serious remnants of Greek thinking today in our culture. There are cool jobs and there are uncool jobs. In Silicon Valley, where I spent half of my career, um, worth is based on innovation meritocracy. In New York, Wall Street's based on earning meritocracy. The world wants to tell us who is and who isn't good, doing good work. But the biblical narrative tells us that work is good whenever it is contributing to the flourishing of creation. And that includes almost all kinds of work from the menial to the so-called white collar. But I'm thinking you know that because you're students at Dort and you're steeped in that. But how does that help us from getting bored? I propose that we become bored when we can't connect what we're doing to a larger story. As Rick Watts, my favorite professor ever probably, said to you last fall, we absolutely all people need a larger narrative to make sense of and give meaning to our lives. So some people out there in the world's narrative is along the lines of survival of the fittest. They may work to provide more for their children so their children will thrive and that legacy, that, that hoped for legacy gives meaning to their life. One of our congregants who works in finance confessed that he worked to make one buck more than the other guys in the office. As a matter of fact, I started calling him one buck more. It just, I could just see him saying that in the office. Pure competition, he was working just to be on top. As a Christian, our narrative is that we work to love. That's a real challenge to think about in lots of professions. Mike, my doorman, turned a job that most consider menial labor into an act of constant service. I think your faculty do the same thing. None of us are gonna find jobs or careers that fill us, fulfill us all the time, but we have to look for the dignity in every aspect of the work that we do. Does it image our creator God? How does it help the greater good in our world? That's the best antidote to boredom. So the compass, the new compass is number one, a solid grounding for our work. Number two, the concept of dignity in our work. Number three, it gives us a moral compass or our faith will corrupt us. I think that's where John's story comes in actually. Again, it's, I like it because it's not such an obvious corruption like insider trading or misappropriation of an organization's funds. It's a corruption of the heart that all of us experience, perhaps more often than not. Why does it happen? Because we're working to serve ourselves rather than to serve God. A lot of Christian conversation, especially in the area of marketplace ministry, is focused on being an ethical person, not stealing, not lying. We might focus on Plato's virtues of justice, courage, temperance, and prudence. And then we add the theological virtues of Aquinas that um, Aquinas added, faith, hope, and love. And then we try and will ourselves to become that kind of person. I'd like to propose another approach. We can't really become a good person of our own willpower. The primary way we even grow a little bit in the likeness of Christ is to recognize our deep sin, repent on it, repent of it, and focus on the grace given to us by God with the gift of his son. We have to die to ourselves and be reborn by the Holy Spirit. So our moral compass, our understanding of who we are under God, will help protect us from the temptations, the corruption that work might present. Fourth, we need a Christian worldview so that work doesn't use us. Now that's interesting. What I'm saying is that if you're not using your work to serve God and the calling he's put you in, it's pretty possible that your work will use you. What do I mean by that? Have you ever been in a job where you feel like you're just a cog in the wheel? You're just a tool. In our modern economy, productivity is so key 
that it's often easy to feel like you're pushed like a machine until you're ready to break. There's a difference between feeling like you're working to serve other people and feeling like you're, you're used like a machine. The challenge is that it's you that has to make that distinction. Typically, the company will not do that for you, at least most of the time. You need to think that through in light of your knowledge of who you are in the universe under God. In other words, what's your place in the biblical narrative and how does this work you're doing fit in that place? I've let work use me. As a matter of fact, I've let it ring me out. And that's happened even when I've been the boss. At the end of a year or more, I've been so overworked and underrested that I can't define myself in any way outside of the number of miles I've flown and the hours I've put in in a particular work week. So what's gone wrong? I think it is that I've forgotten that I'm loved by a God who holds the world together. I've forgotten that he may have given me good work to do, but he actually doesn't need me to do it. He's God, he'll get by without me. I drive myself out of fear, afraid of being poor or out of selfishness, wanting to be, be somebody, even out of fear that somehow I won't be important to God. And those things give work a power over me. Work uses me. We don't need to live like that. And finally, fifth, work that our faith gives us hope in the frustration of work, otherwise it'll crush us. All work is frustrated by the fall. It's a broken world full of thistles and thorns. And sometimes I think inside our Christian faith, our churches promise us some sort of rose garden if we just live out a good faith. But in fact, the thorns are out there. They're either external factors like the brokenness of the economy, the false promises of technology, the selfishness of others. And some of the thorns are deep inside us, our own Achilles heel or idolatries that in fact keep us from getting done what we'd like to get done. So work is extremely frustrating. We can give up or we can become cynics. Either way, it can be crushing to us and our human dignity. So from whence comes our hope? Our hope is in the fact that the redemption has been accomplished and we can live out of that even if it's not fully realized in our day and age. That isn't an Obama campaign hope. It isn't a Pollyanna optimism. It's faith in the fact that Christ defeated Satan is sitting now at the right hand of God. It's a hope nurtured by the Holy Spirit and given to us as a present help. It's a hope that fuels our imagination of what can be and someday will be. And it's a hope that promises, no matter what, that someday we'll see that holy city come down and renew this broken world completely. Work can crush you, that's a given in this world. But we have an antidote, hope in the gospel of redemption and new creation. I pray that we can all be people of hope, that we can work out of a faith-fueled hope. I pray that our faith gives us a compass for work, one that steers us in the direction of doing everything for the glory of God. Thank you, and I hope to see some of you tonight. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about my um, own experience as a high-tech CEO and leader. Um, and I also hope to meet some of you during the day today. I think I'm visiting a few classes. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Thanks. Thank you, Catherine, for that reminder to be people of hope and to put our work in service of God and not just in service of ourselves. Um, thank you also for the reminder to join you this evening in Science Building 1606, uh, as Catherine will help us uh, with a very important project of connecting our work to God's work. Uh, I'd also like to invite you now to put on your calendars in March. Uh, our speaker will be Malcolm de Krieger.
He's the president of uh, Belstra Milling. He, his passion is really to make sure that producers of food and consumers sort of get connected with each other, that consumers know where their food comes from and why it's important that you know where it comes from. So we'll be coming, uh, come and listen to him talk about that in March. Uh, and in April, we'll be welcoming in uh, Christina Cleveland, a sociologist, uh, author of the book Disunity in Christ, Uncovering the Secret Forces, the Hidden Forces That Keep Us Apart. Uh, she will be talking with us, helping us to sort of think through the ways in which we divide the world into good and bad, and why we might want to be careful on how we do that. So that will be in April. Malcolm will be in March. And this evening, there will be another one from Catherine on connecting your work to God's work. We'll see you then. Stretched under old pine trees. 